Next talk is by uh, Willie Mutchler, and uh, the paper is titled Assessing Posterior Sampling Methods in Empirical DSG Models with Application to uh, Weak Identification. So Willie, the floor is all yours. All right, thank you very much for the nice introduction and having the opportunity to present the paper. Um, I really enjoyed yesterday's talks. Um, they were um, very theoretical, of course, talking about local and global identification. Uh, and this talk is not, it's more of an applied nature, um, applied point of view. It's based on some personal experience um, and uh, maybe uh, gives you some, some insight or some tips on uh, how to quickly assess weak identification. Um, so the uh, motivation for, for this paper, um, there are just basically two parts to it. First of all, we all know that um, Bayesian estimation of these D models uh, has rapidly progressed. Um, and maybe one reason for this is that uh, people are actually sharing their codes, how they estimate the models. And at some point, uh, we are able to introduce this to software like, for instance, Dynair as well. And so then applied macroeconomists are uh, now able to, to easily estimate with Bayesian methods um, their models. Um, maybe as a side note, we are already working on the method of moments toolbox as well. So um, there's a first draft on my GitLab page if you want to check this out as well. But this talk is about Bayesian uh, estimation. And right now, um, like what people most often do is uh, they, they run a random walk Metropolis Hastings algorithm, but there are actually also some other sampling samplers. Uh, and when I um, uh, teach uh, my PhD students um, and talk about estimation in these G models. I always um, like give them a, a small exercise. Hey, try to to estimate a small scale model, a medium sized model with a small sample size, large sample size. Uh, try out all those these settings to to get a feeling of what you you're actually doing there and what goes wrong. And so so this is basically one motivation of this paper to to give a um, a look at all these options one can choose, uh, what are best practices here, and um, with a focus on uh, maybe some, some standard models. So the second one, um, the second part of the motivation for this paper is that um, we have seen this yesterday and we will probably see this in the um, uh, talks uh, which are coming uh, today as well, that uh, you should always check the identification of the parameters um, before you go ahead and estimate this. And um, we did uh, a lot of work um, in the current release of Dynair uh, to improve the identification toolbox and there is still uh, stuff to do. Dennis has sent me some, some codes that we want to include as well and uh, this will uh, come uh, into the toolbox as well. But this toolbox currently has, uh, is more focused on local identification, um, which is quite nice so you can easily assess um, using uh, several methods, whether or not the parameters are at least locally identified. Having done that, having said that, um, weak identification, so what you can do with a certain data set and um, what happens with, your, with the estim esti uh, estimation of the parameters when your data sample grows is actually a sort of a different concern and uh, maybe even more important for empirical uh, macroeconomists and the problem is that um, many DSG models that uh, or many DSG models, they actually uh, are quite difficult to estimate because of course they have, uh, the, the likelihood in particular is not well behaved. We cannot uh, use all parameters. We, we have ridges, we have multi-modes, uh, et cetera. So, um, all right. So what, what we do here um, or what we try to, to do in this paper um, we compare uh, the performance of several samplers provided by Danair, um, try to, to give intuition and some tips on how to deal with estimation difficulties and how maybe you can fine tune uh, the different options. And uh, interestingly, as a byproduct, we basically uh, can also say something about the strength of identification. And what I'm thinking here is, uh, I'm, I haven't done this yet, so this, is, this paper is still work in progress and I'm happy if uh, you guys have uh, ideas for that. Uh, maybe we, we can put an option to the identification command to, to sort of automate, automate this, even though it is a bit time consuming, as we will see. 
Um, so nevertheless, I want to, to provide some examples. And uh, right now we have, we have, uh, we have done um, the analysis for the N and Schorfheide model with a small scale model, but very well studied. And I think um, most of you guys in the panel have uh, actually worked with this model. So this might be nice to, to see the performance of this model. Of course, this Metz and Walters model, and then we're we're looking basically for empirical DSG models um, that that are used for forecasting, and uh, we have uh, looked into the Kolas and Rubashek paper, um, but uh, are open to suggestions for different models because this is not really my uh, literature. So, if you have ideas about models we should analyze and put into the paper, please let us know. Um, that would be very helpful. So, what what do we actually do? Um, it is always very good or very advisable. Uh, actually, in, this, in, my, uh, in my opinion, uh, you should definitely do it. You must do it. Check uh, and local identification. And then if you do have issues there, uh, try to uh, cope with that. So in a sense, either change your model, um, use different observations, add shocks, uh, use different function specifications, uh, recheck or at uh, last resort, calibrate the unidentified parameters. Um, then what we do is um, having this locally identified model, we actually simulate data for several sample sizes and estimate the parameters with Bayesian MCMC methods. And uh, we use uh, two Metropolis Hastings algorithm and play around with the um, options there. Okay, what, what is the effect of the number of draws? Uh, either for the random walk um, Metropolis Hastings or the tailored randomized block. What, is, what are the effects uh, of the choice of proposal distribution? We play around with the normal and the student's T distribution. And of course, very, very important, um, how do you um, choose the proposal covariance matrix? And like best practices uh, to, uh, is to use the inverse Hessian at the mode. But we also show what happens if you actually do the prior variance. So take a matrix with the a diagonal matrix with the prior variance uh, on the diagonal. Um, and uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Marco uh, Racho introduced the slice sampler, um, which is actually a Gibbs sampling method. And here we also play around with some settings. There are actually not much you, you can do because it's uh, basically very uh, user friendly in that sense. But we, there are two versions of that, a simple slice uh, or a rotated slice where you have like a initial run with very few draws and give a rough guess for the asymptotic covariance matrix. And this can then be used to, to better um, compute the, the slice. Um, and I don't, in, in each case, I, I really advise to not only run one chain, but uh, use your computer. I have uh, like a computer with eight cores and I can easily run uh, each same chain on uh, each core. And uh, there is a parallel option to Dynair. And if you have, um, if you work with Dynair but have never done parallel, then I have uh, something. I have a YouTube video on this, uh, how to get this started. It takes a couple of minutes, and then you're off you go. Now, having done all these experiments, we actually uh, can say something about weak identification. This is basically byproduct of the analysis right now, um, in the sense or in the fashion of the Bayesian learning rate indicator of. Coop, Pacheron, and Smith, um, that focuses on the speed um, of the average posterior precision. So, so the idea is basically your posterior variance or the inverse of it, which is the posterior precision, should uh, grow the more data you have. Okay, so it's a very, very simple intuitive um, indicator uh, that can be easily uh, implemented here. So what is the related literature. Um, uh, let me have a quick look if there's a QA, not that I see. Um, please feel free to, to, to raise your hand, uh, not, not to raise your hand, but uh, ask a question in the QA. So the related literature, of course, if you, are, um, if you want to know something about samplers and for these G models, there is a, the, a very, very awesome chapter, handbook chapter by Fernandez Villaverde Programmers in Schorfheide, there's a textbook by Epson Schorfheide, which provides awesome um, overview of all these algorithms. Um, when uh, Chip and Ramamuti introduced the, the tailored randomized block uh, Metropolis Hastings, they also discussed in length and detail how to, to tune your, um, 
your algorithm. So this is also a good reference here, which we uh, rely on. Um, of course, for the slice sampler, this is uh, this was introduced in 2003 in the statistics literature and was uh, only currently adapted to these G models. And there, um, Planas, Rato, and Rossi have conducted many, many experiments to, to sort of get best practices here and uh, basically also set the defaults in there. So they're just, um, it's quite user friendly. Um, and if you want to know more about um, these G models and their likelihood, why it is. Uh, not well behaved um, and how to, to cope with the merit optimization, Andre Asen is always a good reference here. Uh, regarding weak identification, we, um, uh, we are related, of course, to Canova and Sala, who basically uh, started the whole uh, discussion about identification, weak identification, uh, or the literature really took off there. And uh, they, they also find in a very small and simple model that weak identification problems are widespread, uh, particularly on small samples. Uh, of course, we have this, this uh, Cooper, Sarr, and Smith paper uh, that proposed a, a very simple intuitive indicator. And I have another paper um, that discusses uh, that identification, both local identification or theoretical identification, as well as the strength of identification depends on your model. It is a model property in a sense, okay? You decide how well or badly identified your, the model is, okay? It depends on the choice of your Taylor rule, of your production function, which observable to choose, maybe introduce different shocks um, or features into your model and the identification changes. Uh, but most related to, to this paper is um, a recent paper, a G JDC paper by Shatra and Shibayama uh, and we, we actually do the same what, what they do. Um, they also apply the Bayesian learning rate indicator on the smith walters model. Um, I, I do have some difficulties repl replicating some of their results. So, so that was basically also starting point for, for this. Um, might be due to the case that they propose to compute the indicator using the Hessian at the mode, which uh, in my experiences is often not well behaved and not reliable. So uh, we strongly argue in doing a full-fledged Bayesian MCMC. They also uh, try to give you a uh, intuitive identification ratio, what, what they call, where they compare the um, posterior um, variance uh, of times the sample size of, of shorter sample sizes and take this into a ratio with the, with the largest sample size uh, you look at and then you get a threshold of one. And if you're, if you're below that, then it's weakly identified. But this does not really work that, that much. And uh, um, in the paper, we discuss a, a different indicator, which do, does not compare with the shorter to the last, largest sample, but subsequent sample sizes. And, um, but uh, like in this presentation, we're just going to look at average precisions um, at the actual numbers. Um, OK, so briefly. Let's go, or let me check whether there is a QA. No. So briefly, um, let me uh, give, give you an overview why we need posterior sampling techniques. Um, um, the, the, uh, the reason is that we usually cannot evaluate our posterior, which is the likelihood of times prior, uh, analytically but we still want to, to do inference with that, okay? We want to compute some functions, uh, say the mean or standard deviation or some credibility sets, and we need therefore uh, to be able to draw from this posterior. And the idea is, okay, le let's provide a, um, a technique to, to get draws and um, some, some, some reasoning uh, that these draws that we get are actually draws from the uh, distribution we are looking at. And once we have that, we can do uh, or use a law of large numbers argument to, to actually compute the mean of the distribution or the standard deviation and do all fancy stuff. Um, we're dealing with uh, linear STSG models because, uh, well, in my reading in the uh, forecasting literature, these are still um, mainly used. Um, and so, of course, this makes it easy to compute the likelihood with the Kalman filter. But the whole idea of those samplers and also of the um, Bayesian learning rate indicator works for nonlinear DSG models as well. But you need to, to, to be able to 
compute the likelihood uh, differently, which, which can be hard. So um, the, uh, the mo most general um, algorithm and the, is the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm, which basically always works. Uh, as long as you, you just uh, um, increase the draws at some point, we will converge to the uh, distribution we, we look for. Um, but there's a key ingredient here that is the proposal distribution. And uh, we have some choice here. Uh, the, the requirements is we simply need to be able to quickly draw from this. Um, and then uh, there's, we compute a probability uh, whether or not we uh, keep this new draw or we discard this new draw. draw. And the probability uh, is defined uh, in terms of a ratio of the posterior kernels of the new draw uh, compared with the, the one we are in the chain right now. So then, then there's uh, some, some tuning needed that um, in a sense, we get, not get stuck in um, areas with very high uh, probability, but every once in a while also visit low probability areas. And so there's some, some fine tuning needed here. Um, all right. Uh, so the one most uh, people use, I think, is the random walk Metropolis Hastings where we simply recenter the uh, proposal to the previous draw, not taking into account all, all other draws, but just the previous draw. And uh, we play around with the normal distribution and the student's t distribution. And uh, very importantly, of course, then uh, the covariance matrix plays uh, an important role for the acceptance ratio. And we um, try out to set what, what is more or less best practice. Uh, sigma had to the negative of the inverse Hessian at the mode. Um, but of course, for this, we need to run a numerical optimization prior to running the MCMC. Or we can simply use our prior information and use a diagonal with the prior variances there. Still, we have a tuning parameter, and um, I mean, Denair, uh, since the, the current version uh, has added a feature that uh, does a pre-run to tune this um, parameter automatically to get a, a certain acceptance ratio, but uh, sometimes you still need to, well, it takes time, of course, and you still need some manual adjustment here. So the problems uh, that uh, we run into here is, of course, we need to find the mode, which again, remember, likelihoods are not well behaved. And even though we put a prior on it and get some more shape, uh, in the case of weak identification, the curvature is low. So uh, finding um, modes using gradient-based methods is uh, very hard. Um, what we can also see um, uh, that the random walk metropolis hasting has poor mixing properties. Uh, which means we have uh, high serial correlation, high inefficiency factors, uh, particular when you have large uh, parameter vectors. Um, so you need, in a sense, very many draws. Um, then the, there's a, uh, another uh, Metropolis Hastings algorithm, a tailored randomized block. Let's go from, from here to there. What, what means block? Um, the idea is uh, very simple that we take at each iteration we actually split the parameters into blocks. Um, ideally, we would want to, to have blocks uh, and put blo parameters into blocks that, that are in a sense similar or different, um, but we, in general, we don't have this information. So what Chip and Ramamuchi propose is they, well, let's do it randomly, okay? And this works uh, ex exceptionally well. Um, what we then do in, um, so we have randomized blocks, what we then do in each block, we tailor the proposal distribution for each block. Okay, so again, here we have several choices and we play around with the, again, with the normal or student's T distribution. And um, uh, of course, have to, to think about the location and curvature of the posterior. Um, we use uh, the CMS, uh, a non derivative based global optimizer. And for the proposal covariance matrix inside each block, um, we then again, uh, check out what happens if we do prior variances or uh, if we set it to the negative of the inverse Hessian. Um, there are many cases where this is not, again, gets an uh, NAN um, or we get a, a non-positive definite um, covariance matrix and do we do some, some error handling here in, in, in a sense that 
in the sense of a generalized Cholesky decomposition where we um, replace uh, eigenvalues that are that are negative with, uh, with positive small numbers and and stuff like that. Um, but we count these cases, of course, as well. Um, uh, the result is that uh, this um, works quite well in practice, but um, so you, you don't need that much draws, but you have uh, low in inefficiency factors and little serial correlation, but it is very costly because you have now several blocks and you re-optimize, re-optimize, re-optimize. And then the last sampling technique we have a look at is the slice sampling. Um, the idea, it is not a Metropolis Hastings algorithm, it is uh, a Gibbs sampler. Uh, the idea is that um, we want to sample uniformly from the region under the density function and actually consider only the uh, horizontal coordinates. So how, how do we do this? Uh, we, we introduce a auxiliary variable, it's called gamma, and build the joint distribution of gamma and our parameters theta that is uniform over the region um, below the curve or below the posterior distribution. And then uh, to, to actually get draws from this joint distribution, uh, we can do Gibbs sampling. That is, we sample, uh, given a, a parameter theta, we sample for, for gamma uh, uniformly on uh, the uh, vertical line. Okay, so from zero to the point uh, of the uh, posterior distribution, uniformly sampled. And then for this point, we get all points below the, um, or we try to get all the region below the posterior distribution, which is uh, called the slice. And then we sample uniformly from this distribution. Okay, and this is uh, a Gibbs sampling technique um, was originally proposed by Neil and adapted to these two models recently. So uh, some, maybe some people are not much familiar with uh, the um, Gibbs uh, sampler. Uh, let me give you a quick univariate example uh, taken from Neil from the original paper. So th the first step is you, you, you look at the line here. Okay, you have a X is now your theta, so your parameter, okay? And then given this parameter, you draw, you compute the posterior value. And on this line, you draw uniformly a some value, say, let's call it y. And then you want to get for given this y, all values below the curve. So this is on the black line over here. Okay, so how do we get this region? And this region is actually what we call the slice. And there are many, uh, or there are some methods to do that. And this is a debate in the econometrics literature. And a very uh, simple method is a so-called stepping out where you define a, a width and then you just go to the left. Okay, I'm still, and you recompute uh, whether or not you are under the curve. I'm still under the curve uh, and there I'm not under the curve. And there you have your lower bound and you do the same to the right. Okay, so you, you sort of skip this region and land to a point where you're still under the curve. So, okay, I'm still under the curve. Go again, oh, I'm not under the curve. So you get a upper bound. And there you have to find, found your slice and you sample uniformly a new X or a new theta in the parameter from this line, okay? And uh, it can happen that the, the one you sample, maybe this one here, you recompute uh, whether or not this is uh, under, under the, the posterior distributions, this one is not. So you can make use of that and shrink the, the slice. And then you recompute here uh, I'm sorry, you, you sample again from, from this smaller um, slice to get maybe this X one. Okay, and then you have a, a draw from under the curve. And then you, you go ahead, given this draw, you get another Y, et cetera. So you do a Gibbs sampling here. All right, so the key aspect here is that uh, we only need uniform random variables uh, to simulate. And, uh, how to exactly determine the slice, in particular in the multivariate case, is a bit tricky. And uh, I refer to Planas, Rato, and Rossi, uh, who do a lot of experiments with all sorts of um, distributions and uh, sort of found uh, a very good way to which we can simply use for these G models to, to, to do so. Okay. Um, another thing is that um, you can uh, actually. Uh, 
run the slice um, not once, but uh, like this is simple slice, but uh, do a initial run to get uh, a rough guess for the asymptotic covariance matrix, and then use this to 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 help you get uh, the, the actual uh, slice and uh, more draw more draws. Okay, this is what we call the rotated slice. The advantage of the slice sampler is um, you don't have any proposal distributions. You do not need to find any modes or uh, check whether your some Hessians or inverse Hessians are well behaved or not. Um, there is not much tuning you can do, um, but you still get a small inefficiency factors and short chains. The downside is that you need to uh, evaluate the, the likelihood um, a, a, a much, uh, much more, a, a, hu uh, a, a huge number of times, okay? So like for the Metropolis Hastings algorithm, you, you have a draw, you evaluate the, sorry, the likelihood and the posterior um, once, but for slice, you need to uh, evaluate this a number of times, okay? So this should be actually posterior. Okay, so this is uh, just a quick primer on uh, sampling methods we are concerned with and now about identification strength. Um, well, we have local and global identification is a theoretical property and it does not require any estimation and it can be checked before doing anything with your data. But uh, what, what we are concerned is, okay, given a specific data set, uh, what is the empirical strength of identification? Okay, how much information can we extract? And uh, the, the idea here is, uh, Okay, let's say you have a locally and maybe also globally identified model. Uh, so all parameters enter the objective uh, function separately and it has a unique extremum, but its curvature is actually small. And this uh, is particularly a case for uh, which you def definitely find in small samples. And uh, why should we care? Well, um, this, uh, uh, this, uh, whenever you, you, you're facing the issue that uh, you cannot or you have difficulties to maximize your likelihood or your posterior or a moment objective function, um, these, these functions uh, sometimes or typically are not well behaved. And um, they have local extrema, they have ridges, they have, well, not much curvature. And sometimes, or my experience, not, uh, yeah, sometimes uh, weak identification is at the core of this problem problem. And so like gradient based optimization does not work well. And uh, like when my, my students play around with the, with the models, um, I uh, can often see, all right, you simulated data and you found, uh, you, you did a good uh, estimation. Ah, okay, let me check. You, you used uh, the true values as the initial values. All right. No, that's no wonder. Okay. So we often see that initial values have a huge impact or even your estimators uh, get to the boundary, which is uh, quite bad for, for asymptotic theory. So um, some, the source of those peculiar estimation outcomes is uh, often or sometimes uh, due to weak identifiability. So you should at least be aware of this. So uh, how do we detect this? Um, and there, there are several methods uh, in the literature. Um, I'm, Currently, uh, we just want to have one that is quickly implemented and intuitively, maybe in a sense. And uh, this is uh, the one by Cooper, Saran, and Smith. And they show that the um, for for a growing sample size, the posterior precision of weakly identified parameters divided by the sample size will go to zero. Okay, so it does not grow as fast as the sample size. But for strongly identified parameters divided by the sample size, it will go to a constant, okay? The posterior precision uh, grows at the same rate as the sample size. So the ratio get, goes to a constant. How do we, how can we compute this? Or how can we check this? Um, well, we simply simulate larger data sets and re-estimate the model with Bayesian MCMC. And then uh, look at the average posterior precisions. Um, yes. So let's, uh, give you a guiding example here. Um, we uh, chose, or particularly I chose the model of N and Schorfheide as the identification uh, sorry, properties. Uh, uh, yes. Okay, there's, there's a question by uh, Toru. Toru, can you raise your hand, please? Uh, 
Okay. Uh, please go ahead. Hello. Hello. So yeah, my question is that uh, uh, from the Bayesian point of view, uh, one way to measure the strength of identification is to check how sensitive the posterior is to a choice of prior. So I wonder that, that your approach of measuring identification, how it relates to some measure of sensitivity to prior. That's my question. Um, yes. Uh, it's also, of course, it is uh, very important in the, in the Bayesian estimation to, to have an idea of sensitivity um, of your estimates to, to, to priors. The, the uh, indicator we're using, um, I mean, theoretically, there it is uh, derived uh, for, for, for normal priors, but the, the same holds for, for different priors. Uh, that's um, what Cooper, Soren, and Smith have, have worked out in, in their paper. And um, the, the, the idea about it, it's still the same. Even though you have a prior, uh, the larger your sample size, of course, the, the influence of the prior uh, vanishes. Okay, so, so take the extreme case, uh, all identification, or, or the whole posterior um, uh, variance or the pos uh, posterior precision is governed by the prior. So you, if you have data and it grows and grows, nothing happens to it. So this will still, the, the indicator will still go very quickly to zero. Okay, and this is the same for weakly identified. Uh, if, if the whole, in a sense, identification happens uh, through the prior, um, where this indicator should, should capture that, okay? It is really um, having a look at what happens to the estimate, uh, to the posterior precision when the sample size grows. So when the, the likelihood more or less takes over, the information in the likelihood. Good. Um, I hope this answers your questions. If, if not, then, then um, give me a... Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, uh, we, we can discuss this later. Um, okay, so uh, we chose this model as the identification properties are very well studied and we uh, particular take a version of the model that is locally identifiable because I want to see how the posterior um, sampling methods work in, in, in practice here. Okay, so we have a monetary policy rule. Um, we have government spending and technology growth as A1 processes. We have a standard IS uh, curve and a Phillips curve and three observables um, uh, for output growth, inflation rate, and interest rate. So um, let's, let's have a look at what, what is the effect of the different choices here. Um, so um, I will I will zoom in, in into these pictures, but uh, so so these are the posterior distributions for uh, given the random walk Metropolis Hastings with uh, two thousand five hundred draws um, for uh, in each row we always take the normal distribution as a proposal density and uh, the the columns is here we do the inverse Hessian for the covariance matrix and here we do the prior variance. Okay, and um, the dark line here is the prior distribution, the uh, dashed line is the, the GP value, and the darker the, the line, this, the, the smaller the sample. So this is T equals 75, and the, the yellow one is T equals 9,600. This is the sample size. All right, and uh, what we see uh, for this parameter, uh, even with uh, 2,500 draws, again, I'm running eight parallel chains here, discarding 20%, um, the posterior distributions basically over all options look the same and they do have the property that the posterior precision, the, the, the width of the distribution, basically I'm, I'm doubling the sample size and it halves here. So it seems to be um, strong, strongly identified this parameter. Um, now increasing the draws, say 25,000 or 250,000, has not much effect in this case, okay? The same uh, for the tailored randomized block with uh, very few draws, only 250. Um, but if you, if you have a look at the computational times, it's like three minutes for, for the smallest sample size, but uh, half an hour for, for the largest sample sizes. Um, so it increases. Well, uh, in the other case, it was just a fraction of a minute. Um, but the posterior distribution also looks similar. There is like with uh, just a few draws, we do see that when we use the prior variance, even for, for, for small sample sizes, 
um, there's there's difference here. Okay, and it's uh, of course no no wonder if um, uh, in Metropolis Hastings actually doesn't care about the covariance matrix. Eventually, the more draws you have, let's increase this. The more draws you have, the posterior uh, or the um, MCMC will uh, converge through to the through distribution. So this is no no wonder here. What about the slice? Um, the slice. Um, this is like the simple slice, and here you can sort of see that the slice uh, captures uh, the. Um, in particular in large sample sizes, the, the multimodality of the likelihood, uh, which if you're familiar with the Ann and Schofeider model, there, is, uh, there are two modes actually. So the, uh, yeah, but this uh, does not look anything compared with the, the posterior distributions we have here. Um, and then if we do actually a rotated slice, run first one with 50 draws and then another one with 200 draws and maybe another one with 2,500 draws or maybe then another one with 2,500 draws, uh, you get that the posterior distributions um, are uh, are more or less the same as what, as what we get with the Metropolis Hastings. But keep in mind that for very large sample sizes, uh, the uh, posterior like um, tries to find out if there is another mode there. Okay, so um, this was uh, the the standard deviation of the monetary policy shock. Uh, let's um, I have one more look at, for instance, the, the um, Phillips curve um, slope, uh, where we actually can see that using the prior variance with just a few draws um, uh, gives you some, some weird shapes here. And uh, of course, if we increase the draws, then the posteriors uh, basically look the same over all options. Okay, and the tailored randomized block uh, Metropolis Hastings algorithm is um, is actually a bit better in, in this in this regard. Uh, whether or not we use the inverse Hessian or the prior variances, um, of course, again increasing draws. That's fine. Um, for the the slice, again the simple slice um, is. Uh, I mean, this is also what Plato, Rato, and uh, Sanders uh, have said that the simple slice does not work well in, uh, for these G models, but a rotated slice. And I, I sort of tend to do a double rotation here to get uh, the, uh, the posteriors. Okay. So um, now let's have a look at the uh, actual weak identification. So let's compute the average posterior precisions. So let's start again with the random walk Metropolis Hastings algorithm. Um, with the normal distribution as the proposal and the inverse Hessian case. So this table here has the 2,500 draws, 25,000 or 250,000 draws. And like, how do you detect weak identification? These are the estimated average posterior precisions for, for the parameters. You simply have a look for growing sample sizes. Does this converge to a number or does it go to zero? And if we have a look, even with uh, 2,500 draws, we can see that all parameters actually converge to a constant here. Okay, so these uh, parameters are very well identified. And they're the same message basically uh, uh, happens if you increase the draws. Okay, there's not much. Uh, if, you, if you're just interested in quickly detecting weak identification, you're able to, to compute the inverse Hessian. It's, uh, everything is well behaved. Hey, go ahead, do a random walk Metropolis Hastings with just 200, 500 draws or something like that, and um, you will get a good, uh, good uh, first insight. Um, using the student um, distribution with the inverse Hessian does not really change the picture. Um, so I, uh, in our experiments, we, we did not find uh, much um, influence here. Um, however, using the prior variance, uh, again, with just uh, 2,500 draws, we do get that, let's say for, for, for this parameter tau, that you could say, oh, this drops. Now maybe is this going to zero? But then again, if you increase the draws, the, the influence of the, um, the prior variance uh, setting uh, more or less vanishes and you can actually see, oh no, it goes to a constant. Okay, so, so what, what are findings for the random walk and Metropolis Hastings? Um, that the normal and students T proposal perform Similar, similarly, um, of course, the more draws are better. 
in the case if you have a model where, where you are able to easily compute the, the, the mode and the inverse Hessian, uh, it is reasonable to, to do um, uh, just the, uh, the, um, the Renwalk Metropolis Haystacks. All right. Uh, but of course, there's no guarantee. And if you uh, have some experience in estimating these G models uh, in many, many cases, particular if you increase the sample size, uh, it, gets, uh, not, it gets hard to do so. And also, I find that using the prior variance needs uh, uh, a lot of draw, draws, and there's much more fine tuning of the, of the C parameter needed. Uh, and I haven't shown this, uh, still we do have uh, serial correlation in our draws and the inefficiency factors are quite high. Um, now, um, the tailored randomized block um, performs overall quite well. I will not go through these numbers, um, I'll just give you the, uh, the findings here. Um, again, normal and students proposal performs similar. Um, even uh, just 250 draws works already well. Um, more is better, of course, but there's not much difference in this model if we go for 2,500 or 5,000 draws, uh, but it takes way more time. Good, um, and then again, prior variances uh, in, the, in this model was all again hard and sometimes weird to, to tune. So uh, maybe uh, it is very advisable here to, to go for the inverse Hessian and have some error handling if it is not well behaved. All right, um, um, now for the slice sampler, um, the, uh, now this is the, the simple slice here. We, we can see that uh, for, for, for many cases we could see, ah, all right, does this go really to zero? But um, again, we saw the procedures. I wouldn't use the simple slice in this case, but let's have a look at the double rotated slice. And here you can also see, all right, this drops, okay? In, in, in many cases, it drops. And if you, but it stays constant, constant, then there's a drop. And uh, if you had a look at the, uh, again, remember the posterior distributions, the, the slice sampler uh, gets the second mode. So, so this is no wonder here. So in a, in a sense, I would like advise to, to maybe not go as large as 4,800 here, but just go do like 1,200 observations and then the slice sampler also gives you a nice picture of uh, well-identified parameters here. Good, um, now time's almost up. We also did the exercise with this Metz and Borges uh, model and um, here our findings are that the slice and the tailored randomized block sampler work exceptionally well. Um, our data generating process was very different from the prior mean, so, so I'm, I guess this is one, one of the reasons um, that also the prior variance uh, method did not work quite well. Uh, but we do find that only um, like three parameters are weakly identified, the rest is reasonably well identified. We do, cannot confirm findings of Chatra Shibayama, who do, who do the same basically for, for Smets Walters, that the Taylor root parameter, Calvo, and indexation parameters are also weakly identified. We don't find this. Okay, um, let me, um, I guess, sum up. Uh, we, we did a sensitivity analysis of all the sampling uh, methods. I hope uh, there are some, some tips uh, you find useful. Um, as a byproduct, we get uh, the identification strength result. And um, I, I guess I can mirror what uh, yesterday was said that for, for larger models, um, identification is, uh, is quite better than, than we find in smaller models. And um, I'm, I'm still, still not decided uh, how to automate this. The rotated slice is something that we can easily automate, um, but the, um, uh, it takes a bit more time than say the random walk metropolis hasting with just 2,500 draws. Um, so yes, and if you do an actual estimation, uh, you of course have to take much more into consideration. Look at convergence diagnostics, inefficiency factors, and here we find that the, again, the tailored randomized block for, is for medium sized, the way I estimate my models, uh, but uh, I use the slice for, for large models. And if you have any suggestions, which models we should actually have a look at that are nowadays used uh, in the forecasting literature, please let me know, because uh, I'm not so much familiar with this literature. All right, thank you.